Love this podcast? Support this show through the ACAST supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. You're locked in. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Hi, this is Earl Oliver from Sully Finish Wrestling. This is Raj Geary with WrestlingInc.com. This is Sean Reed, boxing writer and undercover low-key wrestling fan. And you're listening to Duke Love Wrestling. Woo! Welcome back to Duke Loves Wrestling, the show about pro wrestling and everything else. What's going on out there, folks? I know we <laughs> we are having a interesting week for sure. You know, it's a WWE Hall of Famer who is trying to go for a second term as president of the United States, and looks like he's going to have a tough go at it there as his challenger, former vice president. Uh, may have secured the, the victory. So, but this show is not about any of that stuff. Okay, you have to listen to my other show, Tell Us the Truth, for political talk. This is about pro wrestling. And I think that with all of the, you know, uncertain times and craziness going on in the world, I said, you know something? With this episode in particular, I'm going to bring us back to feeling good, right? Let's feel good about some things. So, I'm going to play for this week a clip from Thunder Rosa, okay? Because, you know, Mission Pro Wrestling, their latest uh, event, the Tournament Out of Hell, first round is going to be happening Friday, 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 okay? We're talking about November 6th, and you can check that out on the Title Match Network there, Title Match uh, Wrestling Network. So we're going to be playing that in, in a few minutes there. And also, a little later on, I'm going to bring back a classic interview, one that is still something that's talked about a few years ago. The Boston Bad Boy and I interviewed the WWE Hall of Famer, Bob Backlund. You know, so I'm going to, I'm going to replay that because folks enjoyed it so much. And it's such a positive interview as well. I mean, Bob really talks about some great stuff that when I when I heard it back myself, I just said, man, you know, I feel real good after listening to Bob Backlund talk. So that is going to be my gift to all of you this week. And we'll start from the top there. Uh, Thunder Rosa, you know, she's been on the show numerous times, and she's done such a fantastic job of detailing Mission Pro Wrestling, why she's doing it, what her motivations are. And it's funny because I thought to myself, I said, you know what? Rather than have her come back on here and repeat herself, let me let me do a greatest hits. So I'm going to play for you some some really key points here just to hammer home what Mission Pro Wrestling is to Thunder Rosa and why it's important for you know everybody to support them and check them out, especially tomorrow's event, or I should say Friday's event, which even if you can't catch it Friday, you can always go back to the title match wrestling network and uh check it out but you know mission pro wrestling's tournament out of hell is their latest event that they're going to be putting on but let's listen to this listen to thunder talk about mission just from a general standpoint i think it is time for us as, as women athletes to not only be part of a, a show like this but you know and start being part of a collective and start demanding what we we deserve which is like safety which is you know our own locker rooms the opportunity to work in, in different aspects of the business that is not necessarily in the ring or as performers. I mean, as a person that has worked in many different companies, I always strive for more and I always ask questions and I always sat in the back with producers, with editors, with everybody because I want to learn everything. You know, I when before I started wrestling, I used to work the camera. I used to be the ring girl. I used to like put the rings together. I used to pretty much do everything from production to clean up to everything because I knew that all those skills can translate to something else. So for us to be able to develop, to create and to put it in practice, 
I think it will be really great. I really do want to empower other women to become businesswomen because this is a business. You know, you can make a living by wrestling. People think that wrestling is just in the ring. It's more than being in the ring. And this is the mentality that we're trying to ingrain in the new generation because that's what's going to empower them. That's going to have gonna, that's when when they go to the big leagues, they're not going to get eaten by the big companies and they're going to be like, you know what? No, this is what I deserve. This is my contract. Let me talk to my lawyer. You're not going to do me like that because I want to be branded WWE or AEW. No, they're going to know what they're worth. And that's a problem that we had. So many people are working and they're like so unhappy working in the big companies because they're not making what they need to make. They're just sitting down there struggling with money. It shouldn't be that way. Professional wrestling can be taken away at any moment again because of COVID. You know, we haven't got out, gotten out of this loop of sickness and, and they can close things down and we are, on, on, you know, ground zero again. I'm not going to stop until I, it's, there's nothing else for me to do. I've said this many times, but I was put in this, in this world not only to, to like be successful and everything, but to make a difference in people's lives. That's what I'm here for. And I'm working so hard every single day as a woman, as a person, as a mother, as a, uh, as a, a wife to do that. But I cannot give up. That's how I decide to live my life. And that's what my legacy is going to be. And that's what our legacy as, as, as a family that believe in other people is going to be. She's such a class act. Uh, somebody who is very clear on who she is in life and what her her duties are, you know, what her mission is. It's so cool. Love uh, catching up with Thunder Rosa. And once again, folks, the Tournament Out of Hell Mission Pro Wrestling's latest event is going to be on the Title Match Wrestling Network. So you can definitely go check that out. Please order it ahead of time so we don't have a mad dash and crash the, <laughs> the website there. You know, we've seen that with some events before. Uh, so if you get a chance, try to order that today. You do not want to miss this. I mean, the, the first round, some of these matches, man, the, the who's who in women's pro wrestling on the indie scene today, you know, Maddie versus uh, Rachel Rose, Vert Vixen, you know, friend of the show. She's going to be taking on Lacey Ryan one-on-one. Remember that at Hell Half No Fury, they, they were going at it with each other in a tag team match. Now they're going to get their hands on each other one-on-one, so that should be interesting. And also you have uh, La Rosa Negra versus Ali Gato, which that'll be very interesting. Okay. Now the tournament out of hell, the whole purpose of this is to eventually crown the Mission Pro Wrestling, their first world women's champion. So this is just round one that you're checking out here. Okay. Now that's not all it's going to be on the card. There's going to be a few other surprises and what have you, but I know that the main event is going to be Thunder Rosa taking on Ray Lynn, okay? And this is just incredible. These ladies, you know, they've been in wild superheroes with each other. They've wrestled all over the world and, and, and crossed paths so many times. Uh, Ray Lynn, you know, she's a, she's a tough one. I've even seen her out there in, in Middle Kingdom wrestling in China. So she loves to, to beat people up all over the world. And, you know, Thunder Rosa, that's the name of her game as well. So this should be an interesting match. I think these ladies are going to tear the house down with each other here. So once again, Thunder Rosa versus Ray Lynn. This is all part of the tournament out of hell, although that's a non-tournament match. That's just its own special attraction match there. But uh, Mission Pro Wrestling Friday, November 6th, it's streaming live on the Title Match Wrestling Network. Now, I know that there, there, are, um, there was availability for folks to watch it live. I'm not sure if there are any tickets left there, but you can definitely, you know, check out Mission Pro Wrestling's website or check them out on Facebook or Twitter, get more information about that. I'm going to be streaming it at, at home. You know, the beer is cheaper there, uh, but I, I can't wait to check it out, especially for this match with Thunder Rosa versus Ray Lynn. But I'm interested in the, um, the tournament out of hell. My prediction, my prediction is it's going to be um, – Vert Vixen and La Rosa Negra in the finals. I think the, the two of them are going to find a way to, to meet up with each other. And also, you know, there's a, there's a special surprise. Somebody's going to be added to the tournament, and we don't know who it is, but, uh, you know, Heidi, right? She's going to be, she's in that tournament, and we don't know who her opponent's going to be. That's going to be a special surprise. Who knows? She could steamroll through the whole tournament as well. So we'll have to wait and see how that goes there. You know, but again, shout out to Thunder Rosa and the whole crew. These ladies are working so hard. They're doing such a great job. 
big fan of Mission Pro Wrestling and what they bring to the table because, th- again, this is what it's all about, folks, women's wrestling. Okay, got to support women's wrestling. I was very impressed with the fact that NXT this week, they had multiple women's matches, Impact Wrestling, multiple women's matches. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be, right? You, you know, you just see the men all the time. That's great, but mix it up, man. Give us some some true diversity out there. A little disappointed in some of the other shows on TV. I won't even name them that didn't have <laughs> more than one woman's match, if at all. That's you know, you guys got to get it together. But um, promotions like Mission Pro Wrestling are just they're extremely important because they're pushing us where we need to go. And what's great is that there's a mixture of folks who are experienced. Then you have folks who are are still learning and still training. I know that somebody like Vert Vixen, she's still doing a lot of work with Rodney Mack and Jazz, which is pretty cool. So, you know, there's there's a lot. There's a lot going on with that promotion, and and I'm excited to watch it continue to grow. Women owned and operated 100%. So good stuff. Good stuff. All right. I'm going to play for you something that, is going to keep these positive vibes going, right? We are talking about an interview that the Boston Bad Boy and I did with WWE Hall of Famer Bob Backlund. And I'm just going to repeat this story here because it's a pretty cool one. I had reached out to Bob because we had a mutual connection. And um, he was interested in coming on the show. And he said, well, when do you want to do it? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's Wednesday. And actually, no, it was Thursday when I talked to him. I said, well, you know, I, I, I record today. So, you know, today might be a little too late, but unless you want to do it over the phone. And we said, no, 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 no. Forget about the phone. Today, okay, no problem. I'm going to hop in the car right now. I'll meet you at the studio. And I was like, what? But yeah, that's what he did. Bob Backlund drove three hours from his home to the secret location and recorded with us in person. He was so excited to be on the show that he came and he did that. And he talked about so many great things and you're going to hear it in a second. If you haven't heard it before, because I know we have an abundance of, of fairly new listeners, which is so great. We keep continuing to build this Duke loves wrestling community. Appreciate you all for listening. Um, But you know, Bob is such a positive guy and he has such a great message that, It's something that we all could use right now with everything going on in the world. So without further ado, and you're going to hear the Boston bad boy. Now, listen, this guy, he thinks he's a big shot. So you're going to hear him talk some nonsense to me. You know how that goes, folks, for all you long-term listeners there. The Boston bad boy who, you know, when he feels like it, he's our producer and and sometimes co-host. But he has a lot of nonsense to say to me. And, you know, I give it right back to him. So for... Anyone who's not used to hearing that uh, incarnation of Duke Loves Wrestling, you're in for a treat there. There's a lot of banter. (laughs) But I'll catch you on the other side of it. Check it out. Okay, Boston bad boy. What was this nonsense you said right before the break there? Well, you don't know how to book guests for the show, obviously. You fail week in and week out because you're not good at your job. So I, once again, went ahead and I, I did what needed to be done. Give me a break. I went out and I got, for this show, not for you, but for this show and for our listeners... A WWE Hall of Famer. In studio, he's being lowered to the ceiling right now. Please give a big welcome to Mr. Bob Acklin. Whoa! Thank you very much. It's uh, it's great to be here, and let's get on with it. Wow. <laughs> there he is. He, let's he, have some more fun. The All American <laughs> Boy, Bob Backlund. Jeez. I just got done eating the best steak I've had in a long, long time, and it's only about four, five, six blocks from here. Oh, wow. beautiful! <laughs> you see that? But you let Bob Backlund into the secret location. Absolutely, because a man like Bob, he gets the keys. All right. Well, first of all, Bob, please don't put me in the chicken wing. Okay, <laughs> I, I respect you and I appreciate you 100. percent So I don't want any problems here. All right. Now, we saw you recently on WWE TV. You had a program with Darren Young. So you got you to gotta level with me here, Bob, because you were around for over 30 years. How the heck did you convince the WWE to get you back on TV in your 60s? Well, you know what? Uh, uh, it's all about uh, timing. And uh, Darren Young was looking for uh, uh, an, uh, somebody to uh, train him. And he was looking all over the country. And uh, it finally came up with, uh, you know, we're right here in Connecticut. Why haven't I asked Bob Backlund to be my life coach? 
<laughs> and he came and asked me uh, if I would mind uh, being his life coach. And I said, sure, sure would. You're a great man, and you're uh, good for the business. And uh, and he, uh, he went to Vince, and uh, that's that's history. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And it's funny, too, Bob, because you were inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2013, which was long overdue. I mean, here's a guy that you've wrestled all over the world. You've wrestled everybody. In fact, you chronicle your career and your latest book, Backland, from All-American Boy to Professional Wrestling's World Champion. So let us know about this book that you did with Rob Miller there. What can fans expect when they pick this thing up? Uh, they can expect a, a very good read, and they can expect to know me better than my brother does. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's how detailed it is. Uh, I suggest to a lot of the independent contractors – in the wrestling business, to use this book as a model for the how the way the business should go and the people in it should be. Uh, it's all about wrestling. It's all about my life, and uh, you know, my life. Uh, the first fifteen years was a very disaster thing. Hmm. I, uh, I, I was on the fence and going to fall in the dirt and sink into it. Until one time, I watched somebody do something that I didn't think anybody would ever be able to do. And the young man was my age. And after I saw him do that, I said, if he can do it, why can't I? Wow. And I uh, I went home, got two five-gallon pails, filled them up with cement, and put a pipe in between them. That's my new barbell. My hero the year before, he was, it was a wrestler in high school in Minnesota. He won the state tournament in his 10th grade year with, at 165 pounds. That's impossible. And you know what? That young man came to my high school, and he was in a tournament that we were having. And my uh, coach said, he had this Kirk Anderson. They asked. He asked, "Is there anybody here that could maybe give him a little bit of a match?" And my coach says, "Bob Backlund's undefeated at the time, and maybe he could." When I found out, they moved. I was at 175, and they moved him up to wrestle me. And when I found out that I was going to wrestle him. I should have grabbed my mom's keys and ran out of Dodge. <laughs> but you know what? After a year, I defeated my hero. And that was a spark. And that's, that was a starting point. And that carried you for your whole career there, huh? That's still going on. What gets you into wrestling early on? What gets you in from being a kid facing some hardships to saying, you know, wrestling is an avenue? I know you, you were involved in football and, and in collegiate wrestling, but what, what's the spark? It takes a certain kind of, I think, person to say wrestling's the thing that does it for me. The, the profession, I, I no, I didn't watch it. My mom was watch it more than I did. She, we couldn't leave the house until it was over, and if we were gone <laughs> someplace— uh, um, at a big party, we'd have to go home anyway and get there before wrestling was over. But uh, And I knew all about wrestling. Right. Uh, it was Vern Gagne and the AWA out in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I didn't idolize it or anything like that. But um, uh, I met somebody in Fargo, North Dakota in 1973 or 1971. And uh, the guy came up and uh, said a few words. And, um, and he asked me, did you ever think about getting into the wrestling business? That's great. And I said no. And I went out and played uh, semi-pro football uh, in Mundelein, Illinois, for the Bears. And uh, I was driving home, and uh, there was people in that program that had been there for 10 years and never got any place. Sure. So I, uh, I, uh, that light come to head in my head, the wrestling business. There you go. Because of what this gentleman said in, in the YMCA in Fargo, North Dakota, in 1971. <laughs> and who was that gentleman? Superstar Billy Graham. <laughs> the yeah. man that you beat for the WWF World Heavyweight Championship. On February 20th of 1978. I love I'm, the lead-in. I'm, I'm standing in the middle of the ring, 
Yeah. And I'm looking over at my opponent. He's got muscles all over. <laughs> he's got this and that. He's got charisma. He's got the belt around his waist. And uh, I'm standing there. And I'm taking that belt home with me that <laughs> night around my waist. <laughs> and That's it's crazy. the guy that in 1972 was trying to convince me maybe to go into business. Yeah, unbelievable. I think he was right. I think yeah. we can say uh, he was right. Yeah, and, 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 and at the time, when I was taking that from him, he was trying to talk Vince out of changing it. Vince Mann Sr. Mm -hmm. But Vince McMahon give, give me his word, and he's a man of his word. Wow. He didn't change his mind, and uh, superstar Billy Graham was doing very well with the belt around his waist as far as uh, house shows. Mm. Yep, but uh, but he, he said no. I uh, I promised him, and so, uh, so superstar didn't want to drop the belt because he was making a lot of money on the house shows. Yeah, yeah, and he 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 didn't. He looked at me and stuff, and the All American Boy, and sure. I'm this guy, you know. But um, you know, I uh, um, I just respected Vince Senior for sticking with his word. And how long did you hold the championship for? The six years. Six years. You hear Unbelievable. that? Unbelievable. Yeah. Six years, the same champion. Yeah. In a day and age when people complain about Brock Lesnar being champion for a little over a year. Well, I think the business, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we've gotten a short attention span business nowadays mm. where they would develop talent and move them around and keep and build build a character, build build a following. Uh, where you could have someone people enjoyed to see for six years instead of saying, well, we're bored already after six minutes. Sure. And so, yeah, well, you know, I got a little, like, how big of a repertoire did he have in, of moves in the ring? Hmm. Two? Good, good point. A, 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 a suplex city? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, how many times can you suplex somebody? Right. Right. But uh, compared to maybe the All-American Boys' large repertoire, of movers. Yeah, that's very interesting. We haven't really talked about that much. We've talked about, you know, gimmicks. We've talked about stuff evolving over time. But again, the repertoire of moves sure, sure. is something that's totally changed. You talk about the, the acrobatic stuff, the flippy stuff, yep, yep. but sort of has replaced an actual armament of moves that you can go in the ring with Bob Backlund and you're getting a show because you never had the same match twice. Exactly right. You know, exactly right. You never did the same match twice, Bob Backlund. No, no, and never. They got it got so they would they would do it over and over and over, mm. and that's all they knew. But uh, my uh, my goal was to slowly draw the people into the match, mm -hmm. slowly that is, right, and um, control that. And listening to the people is very important, and um, it's it's uh, it's pretty simple. Do you think uh, maybe nowadays, in in some ways, matches are sort of overwritten? Where the where the wrestlers themselves don't have enough leeway to listen to the crowd, feed off that. They're right. sort of they have these points they're going to hit, and absolutely. it's time absolutely. to go. Absolutely, yeah, you're you're absolutely right, and I'm sure I'm surprised that you pick up on that because you know they we knew how we wanted to end the match, right. and then when we got in the ring, the people told us how to get there, how we we're going to get there, yeah. and when we were going to get there. When you you want you start out slow and you just you, and even you I, I used to walk slower than I normally walk right <laughs> just to <laughs> slow it down you, so and, and, uh, and you want the people to be down as low as you can and then you're gonna get them a little excited then you're gonna get them a little more excited <laughs> right. and then you're gonna have a blow off you're gonna uh, go home at the end that's at right. the peak that's at the peak when right. you got the people everybody in the building cheering for you whew, that's it. We're out of there, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way it should go with it. Well, absolutely. I mean, I yeah. think. But that when you you do have a when you do have a set program in your match, mm. you you can't you can't do that. You can't change it. You got to keep it that way, and it's it and it gets it gets old for it would get old for me to do it over and over again. Sure, because every match I had, I was I was excited to be in there to try to do something. Different. Well, there's a creative process yeah, yeah, that you yeah. get to participate yeah. and, in. And the, the, it's like art, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think that the you know again over scripted potentially. We talk a lot about injuries happening a, seemingly a lot more frequently. Maybe it's that these this, these talent can't develop those skills to think on their feet in the ring, and when something goes off script. It can get out of control pretty quickly, I would think. You know, injuries can happen well, very quickly if you're not I've, very well versed in what to do to, you know, to, they, to deal They with may it. be pushing the guys too quick. You know, I, it was five years from the time I got in the business right. to the time I got the championship. Mm. And uh, uh, I was in the ring enough where I had it down pretty pat. Right. I had a lot of hour matches with a lot of the most of the, great, the greatest wrestlers in the business 
and uh, they were very kind to me, and they were very patient and uh, and stubborn. <laughs> they, they wouldn't let you know get by with anything, sure. and, uh, and that that's uh, that's worth a lot. Right. Yeah. Wow. So talk to us a little bit about you said that you know that, that that first five years. What's the first match? What's the first pro wrestling match for you like? Do you do you remember it? Do you remember, you know, how that felt to step in the ring as a pro for the first time? Yeah, I remember that very well. <laughs> and we were just talking about that. Yeah. And my first match, I was kind of thinking I was kind of cool, so I tried to jump over the top rope, and I, I spun around the rope. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I would do. And then embarrass you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. And then uh, geez, I wish I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> so the next time, I rolled under. Yeah. Well, all <laughs> the way lesson. Yeah. Anyway, at, and later on, this was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. All right. And I left home. I had a, a green Chevrolet Apella and a, and a, 20, a $20 bill. And uh, and uh, but anyway, at the end of that match, I got everything. I didn't know where the dressing room was, <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up in the in the English classroom. <laughs> oh, oh my god, that's funny. <laughs> no, I, it was, yeah, but I, but I yeah I uh, I couldn't I I lost you know it was, everything seemed upside down and I, I just couldn't figure out where it was. Were you, were you hooked though? Like were you after that? Were you just riding that adrenaline, going, "This is it. I'm I'm where I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be." No, I, well, I uh, yeah, I I'm, I was going to do this. You know, yeah. it's, uh, that's all. It's to it. I'm you know, you got to start someplace. You got that first one right. in, yeah. and then hopefully the next one will be better. It's all downhill I learned, from here. I yeah. learned a lot of lessons. <laughs> yeah. Two of them: one, don't jump over the top rope, and two. Uh, find something that you could say, okay, there's where it is. That's right. <laughs> locker is. Unbelievable. Yeah. We're talking to WWE Hall of Famer Bob Backlund, you know, and now we can say author. Author, yeah. Bob Backlund. Uh, from All-American Boy to Professional Wrestling's World Champion. What a, what a, what a title for a book there. And when yeah. we talk about All-American Boy, what, is that, what does that concept mean to you, Bob? When I think of uh, All-American Boy, um, I think uh, – of a person that lives by the golden rule. Treat people how you want to be treated. And that's one of my rules in life. I respect everybody. We're all equal. We're all human beings. And we're out there to do good things. I, I, uh, I kind of like, liked it when they uh, started calling me the All-American Boy. Uh, and I, I think I lived it, mm. and uh, my life went so good, except for those first fifteen years. But the changes that went through my life, it was a miracle, um, and uh, I got a lot of people to thank for it. I have uh, a lot of people up there. I, uh, I love my world. I love this world. And I love every person on it. Now, what's interesting about that is that for years, um, they wanted the WWF wanted to turn you into a heel because you were the all American boy, you were the baby face, you were the person that children could look up to, and you would say that during your promos. And you resisted turning heel because you didn't want your children uh, to have to endure that. Tell us about that time when before you actually decided that you were going to go that direction. Well, that was it was in the, in the eighties in the, in the middle eighties. Um, you know, Vince wanted me to uh, turn into a bad guy, and and then have matches with Hogan. Mm. And uh, and I said uh, I can't do that. And he said, Why? I said I got a daughter that's going to start school next year, and I'm not going to do it. And uh, he said, What about the money? I said. Um, my family is more important than money. I'm not going to let her down. I'm not going to have her have a big pains of our people calling her father names and this and that in school. That's not going to happen. I don't care what the mom needs. But then years later, you came back to the WWF at the time, and you had a program with Brett the Hitman Hart. Yes. And some would say that you actually turned into a heel, but you did it. The Bob Backlund way. Tell us about the when you came back and, and how you were able to continue to be Bob Backlund while at the same time evoking booze from the fans. Well, you know, in the in the eighties people were a certain way. In the nineties, 
they weren't in that certain way. They didn't want to hear about mom and dad and apple pie and doing the right stuff. Mm. They wanted to hear lying, cheating, and swearing. Mm. And I wasn't going to do that. And uh, I went to Vince McMahon Sr. and I, uh, Jr. and I asked him if I could be a bad guy now. But let me be in a bad guy by being good. There you go. And if you listen to my discourse, discourse, that, that means what I was saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. We, we're talking to a couple of Latin yeah. students yeah. here. You're all right. The blank <laughs> stares we gave. Yeah. I mean, you got to clarify no, for us. Well, it. I looked at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, I, uh, I um, just, I said, uh, you know, I believed that I was trying to save the world. And people asked me if I went crazy then. It was because I was so serious about what I was trying to do. I wanted to fix it. <laughs> I wanted to get the, that, the, the people back to that high level of integrity mm. and honesty and working hard, taking care of your children, and basically treating people how you want to be treated. And uh, I, uh, I thought I was going crazy too at times. <laughs> but uh, you know what? I was doing a pretty important job. I even did a thing where, you know what? You should not throw garbage out of the window of your car. <laughs> You're making a mess out of our country. Yeah. You know what? Every time you go to throw garbage out the window of your car, I want you to see my face. That's great. And I'm going to say, don't do that. <laughs> and they booed you for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they but, but, booed you. But you know what? Um, people need to be told. Mm. Um and there's I, there's garbage all over. I I pick up as much garbage as I can, no matter where I'm at. Wow. Uh, I I just don't like it. So it's not a gimmick. This all American boy thing. This <laughs> is this is really who Bob Backlund is. Well, this goes to to what we've talked about before on this show, and we've interviewed wrestlers before and talked about gimmicks. Mm. If a successful gimmick has to embody something within the person, mm. you can't be something you're not. Yeah, you're, yeah. Even if you are playing a character, you have to come. It has to come from somewhere. You you, uh, you made a good call on it. That, yeah, that's hundred you know, percent. Yeah. Because it's you. We we've seen wrestlers who have an inauthentic gimmick. Roman and Reigns, <laughs> and 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 it doesn't it doesn't ring true. It doesn't connect with yeah. the audience. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. feel right. So I mean, it, it was very smart. I think to say, all right, I'm going to turn heel. By being even more myself That's it. than yeah, I was yeah. before. And I'm going to push it down your throat. That's right. Exactly. And people don't want to push down their throat. That's they right. don't want to hear about this work or that work. They, you right. know, yeah. That's so, amazing. But uh, I, had, I had a lot of fun to it. You know what? If I wouldn't have done that, I probably wouldn't be here today. Mm. What makes you say that, Bob? I would be too shy. I'm not going to speak in front of this microphone. <laughs> I'm too embarrassed. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I, 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 yeah, I wouldn't do it. Like, like I, like uh, I was inducted to the Hall of Fame. They wanted to write a script. I said, "You can't write a script." And I, I walked up to the mic and uh, uh, and I got that close to the mic, about two inches, and I still didn't know what I was going to say. Wow. <laughs> but uh, I get compliments on my talk. Uh, it's to this day, people loved it. People yeah. absolutely and loved it. But it was all just m- from my heart because it was you, yeah. and yeah. that's what they loved about that yeah. speech. Yeah. Tw- yeah. Twenty thirteen, the yeah. WWE Hall of yeah. Fame, yeah. of yeah. course. Yeah. You know, when it comes to that part of the business, the talking part of the business, the promo part of the business on camera, when you make it to pro, h- how did you approach that? I mean, well, not everyone's you know necessarily what? a natural everybody, talker. Everybody made a lot of fun of me in my interviews as as a babyface. They said he can't do a promo, but. Uh, when I turned into a bad guy, all of a sudden <laughs> it went away. <laughs> it was like Whoa, it went away, right. and uh, and there's what didn't there wasn't too many people that wanted to follow it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and I ran for Congress in 2000. Yeah, and all the politicians were out there, and there was a group of people out there, and they figured they'd put me on first, sure, because I wouldn't know what to say. <laughs> and they come up to me and says, "Now what are we going to do now?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you follow an act like that? Yeah. You know, I was out, you know, you know, me shaking hands and. Grabbing them and stuff and having fun with them and then, you know, this and that and raising heck kind of sort of. And it, it was good. And then it got like, a, they were all, everyone was fired up. Sure. <laughs> and then sure. they said, oh, God, how, you know, <laughs> my God, why did you do that? <laughs> now, I know you were trained by some of the legend, legends in the business. And it, getting, you know, even now, training as a wrestler concentrates on the physicality, the moves, especially from a safety aspect. When you were training, 
Was there any uh, training towards the on mic stuff, towards the crowd stuff, towards no, that? No, no. It was all left up to you to kind of it's, come up with that system. You, you have to uh, get used to something. Yes. Right. You have to. You have to. Um, you know, do it yourself. Dig deep and, and figure yeah. out what you're going to yeah. be yeah. Yes, yes, and, yes. and how you're going to present, yeah. which is but, amazing. And, and the, the thing that changed my ability to speak is uh, coming, becoming the bad guy. And, uh, and I, you know, it, it, uh, it really fit. And it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it opened up a whole new world for yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> really yeah. connected with the villain there, like Duke does occasionally. But again, then, you know. again, I didn't think that I was a bad guy, though, so it, it was right. like being, you know, yeah. You just double down. I you said, get to really let be. Let me be good. Bad by being good. <laughs> That's great. What, what did your family feel about the Mr. Backlund uh, uh, character? My daughter was very worried. <laughs> oh, no. She, she thought Dad lost it, huh? <laughs> no, no, that not that so much, but uh, there's a lot of crazy people out there, <laughs> and they didn't want to be agitated. Yep. And I was, you know, I was getting in their, uh, um, under their skin, maybe, and she was just worried about that. And, uh, Speaking but, of which, you know, we... we uh, I, but, you know, sir, uh, Dick Murdoch, told me to keep my family out of the business. And I kept them as far away from the business as I could. Why? Because uh, the business destroys marriages. Wow. And I've been married for 43 years. Wow. And I love my wife more now than ever. That's great. (laughs) And you've been all over the world. And I've been all over the world. And I always come home. Yes, sir. uh, And our daughter... um, is a wonderful person and fun to be around, and um, you know, it doesn't get any better than that for for me as a person to have those people as my family. family. WWE Hall of Famer Bob Backlund, jeez, uh, he's really dropping some gems on us today. The family, the family is the most important unit on this earth, and I think the family has to be rebuilt and uh, designed uh, where they stay together and they the mom and dad teach their children about success mm. about hard work about treating people how you want to be treated about smiling about being happy have fun in your life i have a fun every day in my life i never say i don't like that i used to say that about spinach I, that was, sorry <laughs> <laughs> but but i wanted to eat spinach and I kept telling myself, I love spinach, and now I eat it like popcorn. And you see these little messy things on my shirt? Mm. I was eating spinach, and one of, the ri- mm. one of the little pieces got on my ne- neck here, and it got on my white shirt, and it bled through it. <laughs> and I was sort of embarrassed about you guys seeing me like that, no, but uh, right. I couldn't find a place to buy another white shirt. <laughs> oh, not as crisp as that. Then. And I didn't have time to go home and get one no, and come I'm back. Just, you know, he's, he's definitely, he's three times the size of us, so yeah. he's definitely been eating his no, spinach. That's, that's right. All. That's right. He's <laughs> Popeye. No you are that. the real Popeye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I put a, a post in Duke's wrestling crew to our uh, loyal listeners here, and they have a couple of questions for you, Bob. So I'm going to fire off a few uh, listener-submitted questions. Let me see. Here's one from uh, Katina Rice. How did you come up with the chicken wing finishing move? Um, I um, the, the chicken wing has been in the business forever. And the cross face has been in the chicken wing forever. Chicken wing, cross face. Mm. Your arm is under his arm and your hands are right there. I was the first one to grab my hands having the cross face chicken wing uh, having the wing, chicken wing and the cross face together. You know, I, it was just a matter of me cl- clasping, clasping my hands. And it's a heck of a finishing move, I'll tell yeah. you. I mean, no one's getting out of that. Yeah, it, it can ache a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> a little Especially bit. Mike. We're gonna, we're gonna, yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, i got to do some stretching before this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so oh, I, yeah. I, I got a question from uh, from Greg Coleman. He wants to know who you feel, Bob, is the best technical wrestler in the business today. Technical wrestler? Uh, today? Yeah, in the modern, yeah, um, in the last couple of years even. You know? you know, I don't know the background of a lot of people. Sure. But uh, um, at one time, I would have said the Iron Cheek was. Oh, wow. <laughs> he, was, he was in the Olympics in Mexico. He, he, uh, he won a medal in the Olympics in wrestling. Sure did. You know, and so uh, that's the kind of guy that... Uh, you know, he's going to probably be the tough, one of the tougher guys in the business. Now, I know for a fact that you wrestled the Sheik at the Boston Garden back in the day. Yes. And uh, you wrestled him many times. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, that guy's a character, as we all know, as he makes it known to the whole world. Yeah. What's yeah. the experience working with him? You know, well, I, I liked work with him because we, we fit together. You know, he liked wrestling, and uh, I went after him wrestled him, and he'd come back. And, you know, yeah, we, we, we had fun in the ring. It wasn't hard. It wasn't one time they the ring didn't show up and they we, <laughs> the they, they had they got, went out and got a wrestler and turned him or rest, just a mat yeah. for, with the wrestling team at the school. It was at a high school and yeah. uh, and uh, the guys didn't like it, but she and I went out there and we had fun. Wow, <laughs> yeah. wow! Like that's thinking on your feet, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Iron, Iron Sheik but, is one of those guys that will badmouth anybody, but he never badmouths uh, Bob Backlund. You, you know those big clubs he used to have? Yeah, the Persian clubs. Yeah. Do you know those, Mike? Yeah. Anyway. Um, there was one night on TV he had those two uh, uh, things standing up and down, and he's challenging everybody in the United States to go out and do it. <laughs> and nobody went out there. <laughs> and they were hitting there. The time was passing. Yeah. I went out there, and I swung his clubs. <laughs> and uh, That's why he respects and he, you. And he was shocked. <laughs> and he jumped on me. Yeah, he did. One of the clubs went up in the air. One of the clubs went down. One hit me in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, it was hard, you know. Those things are heavy, um, yeah, yeah. but um, I did it, and uh, um, he 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 did respect that a lot. He gave me the clubs. No kidding. A couple months later, he said, "Here, have these." Look at that. I never thought anybody would be able to do that over here. Wow, that's a story you're not going to get it anywhere else. I was going to say on this that's, show. That's a heck of a that's a heck. Well, of we a bring story the Hall of there. Famers in here. <laughs> got another question, dude? Yeah, we got another one here from uh, Lenny Gross. And, and Lenny actually worked uh, the Memphis Territory as hitman uh, Scott McKenzie. He said, I know Bob made more money with the WWWF, but what did he feel about working in Florida for Eddie? Talking about the legendary Eddie well, Grant. Speaking of money, um, I might have made a lot more, but that's not too important. It's how much you save. <laughs> Good point. That's right. Good point. Who cares how much you make? You don't have anything at the end of the year. Absolutely. Or if you put it up in your nose. <laughs> yep. Then you complain to somebody else. They don't have any money. <laughs> That's a good point. So, so I, I uh, no matter where I was, I came out with a profit because <laughs> I, I saved my dollars. And uh, I, uh, um, again, I had fun doing it. Even in Florida for Eddie Graham there? Yes. What, what, what yeah. was Eddie Graham like as a promoter? Eddie Graham uh, uh, treated me very well. Uh, and uh, he um, did some things. He he was very close with Vince Sr. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure he was on the phone quite a few times talking about uh, finding the All-American boy. And um, I think he, at some point, he probably said, you know, he'd be the one. Mm. And uh, matter of fact, I'd be almost positive of that. Oh, uh, well, we talked a little bit about Sheik. Who, who do you think in, uh, and this is like the rapid fire question, who do you think uh, in, in your career your favorite opponent, favorite person to work with? Um, I, have, I loved every match I went to. I couldn't wait to get up in the morning and go on the road. <laughs> and I had some people that I really liked going on the ring. One of them was Don Morocco. Oh, yes, The Rock, the original Rock. Don Morocco. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah he was... Uh, he had a big repertoire of moves that he could make, and uh, uh, he could get me in a short arm scissor, and I could pick him up with one arm, and uh, <laughs> and, and I like to do that because it's he. There's no way that he could help you in that move. Uh, it's 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 you're doing the work, <laughs> and right. uh, uh, so anyway, yeah, Sergeant Slaughter, of course. Um, you know, it, it, Don Morocco. He we had a match in Philadelphia one afternoon. For an hour, and then we went to uh, the Capitol Center, or vice versa, mm-hmm. the Capitol Center, and we had an hour there too, in in <sighs> in, in, a, in a amount of uh, like probably eight hours. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about the territories and uh, the traveling that you guys did when when you're coming up. It's not the same anymore. I mean, no. with the consolidation of everything, it's almost as if I I think personally, it's it's a detriment to the to the to the art of wrestling because. The experience you get on the road, the people you learn from, the matches you have, those great stories don't, they're not going to happen anymore. You know, you know, 30 years from now, is Roman Reigns going to tell us a cool story about doing two shows in an eight hour span? It doesn't, you know, and, and, and I think it goes back to that whole thing of having a repertoire, like these guys being able to learn and then learn by doing 
they're not going to have that experience. And I think yeah. overall, you start to see some repetitive stuff. You start yeah. to see a focus on things that other than the purity of it. Mike, learning the art of wrestling can't be done in the ring. You got to do it with the ring and the people. So you have to have another wrestler in there with you showing you what you do. You couldn't you could work out in a ring sure. without the people forever and never you'd never You're learn it. Better. You'll never learn it. You need you have to have that feeling. Yeah, uh, that you got them and you and, 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 you, and you think you can get them a little more and a little more. Right. And then like I say have that have that peak in the match. Well, it's like poker, right? You're not playing you're not playing your opponent, you know, you're 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 playing you're playing their hand. You're, you're playing the audience. You're not playing your opponent. Yep, you're you're right, right. you're in the ring. What you're doing is interacting with them, the people yep. around you. Yep. And you're playing that 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 emotion and then that energy. Yep. And I think with this the overly scripted tight TV, all that stuff that goes on now, where it's you know promo, it's like reality TV. You're losing that organic rhythm. You're losing that connection with the audience and. I think the WWE is going to have trouble with the audience moving forward. I think that they some of the gimmicks that aren't aren't clicking because their their guys aren't able to make those connections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you'll down the road we'll see, but uh, um, you know they're they're haven't doing pretty well in the gates, and sure. th- that's the bottom line, right? Uh, whatever they do in the ring, but the bottom line is uh, people in seats, mm. right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, they're diversifying a bit with the, the the revenues they get from online streaming and all this other stuff that happens. But if that gate number starts to sway, that's when they're going to get worried. I that's mean, that's when, when they're going to have to go back to basics a yep. little bit. Yep, that's when it'll that it'll change. Yeah, right. And, Bob, uh, if if there was one thing that you would want to be remembered by from your stellar career, uh, what would it be? How, how do you want to be remembered historically? That I treat people right. It, that I treat people right and. Uh, I usually told them the way it was and, uh, you know, just um, let them zip up a good person and probably a good family man. You know, that's that that's good enough for me. He didn't say a, a great wrestler, hmm. didn't say a Hall of Fame champion, said a, a good family man. He treated people right. Well, that's the tougher thing. That's the tougher road, isn't it? That's to, to, to be good, to do good. It's harder than the work you do, you know. Yeah, like yeah. that's that's commitment, I think. You know, and, yeah. and we were talking earlier. You, we were talking, and we said, said something about you can't buy respect. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I want to talk about the book a little bit. What made you do the book? What What said you know what well, I'm going to sit down? I wanted and, to have a book. I had actually had a book written in 1985, Ooh. and no publishing company would publish it. And uh, the re- reason they had because. At the time, there hadn't been any p- books p- written by any wrestlers, and they didn't want to take a chance. Sure. So I went on to my life, on and on and on, and thinking about I, I always wanted to get a book out, and then um, and then I, you know, the WWE they finally they they have it where they kind of do the book thing for the wrestlers, and sure. I, di- I didn't want to do that because I w- I uh, I wanted to say the way it was. I didn't want to have get in a situation where Clearances. like Bruno with the, with the with the Bruno in the in the movie they were going to make they changed something that like wasn't really what happened he he stopped doing it anyway uh, and I thought geez I'm 60 years old and I haven't got a book out yet and then I thought I'm 65 <laughs> don't have a book out yet and uh, and then I got a in 09 I got an email from Rob Miller. He said, I was his childhood hero as he was growing up. And he got a, a degree from Yale University, and he graduated as an attorney in, in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, he wrote two other books. We set up a meeting, and he wanted to find out if was, I was really that person that was his idol. And he, I told him my life story, and he put it on paper. Oh, wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. And and uh, Hot Rod, Rowdy Roddy Piper, God say. rest his soul. He wrote the foreword, yeah. And Which that, is funny because you almost don't, at the book you go, oh, wow, by the way, wow. And if that's not way, enough, yeah. <laughs> we've got a foreword by uh, the legend, another legend. And he did a great job. And I, you know, I, I was, later I was telling him, but uh, um, I introduced uh, Piper to Rob Miller. And I said, uh, I said Mr. Piper, you say it exactly the way it is. 
I don't want you to try to make me feel good or anything like that. If I if it happened that way, say it that way, and I'd leave. And uh, I I didn't know what he said or what uh, Rob Miller wrote down, but when I read it, I cried three times. Wow! Because wow. he because of what he was so kind. And uh, so. I, I feel like that's sort of the theme of the discussion tonight: authenticity. Mm. You know what I mean? It's sort of like authenticity in who you are. I think authenticity in is better for wrestling as a business. It rings truer authenticity when your friends can say good things about you. And that is the truth, you know? And, and uh, I think that's incredibly impressive. And I think that that's, uh, I think that's why you're a legend. Well, I'm on a mission today. I'm on a mission and it's the most important mission I've ever been on. And uh, in that mission, I want to, I want to take over uh, what Jack O'Lane was doing with a blender way back in the, 60s and 70s and mm-hmm. 80s and even in the part of the 90s he, he did a lot of things firing up of people yeah and i i actually uh related to the book uh he had a blender um but i related to the book where in the book i i got energized when i was 15 years old by watching something and uh, i'm hoping that uh there's energy enough in that book where other people would maybe gain some spirit or learn something new that would help them get better in life. And, and um, I want to go around the country and and do good things and in- inspire people of all ages. It's never too late to make a little difference. It's never too late to change your ways and go out there and Again, treat people how you want to be treated. See what I mean? And, and what a perfect way to end it there, too. Bob Backlund, just such a gentleman, such a class act. Really appreciate Bob. The WWE Hall of Famer, one of the greatest pro wrestlers of all time, and really a quality human being. So good stuff there. And I want to thank Thunder Rosa once again. You know, like I said, I pulled out some of her greatest hits. She doesn't need to repeat herself. You know what it is, man. She's here on a mission, just like Bob Backlund to help others, to bring something of quality, not only to pro wrestling, but to people's lives in general. And it's just these two people that I, I hold in high esteem and appreciate them. And to hear from them at a time in our nation where there's so much uncertainty and you know we've got the pandemic going on and people don't know who the next president's going to be and all kinds of, it's like, you know what, sometimes it's good to hit the reset button hear some positive words from some positive folks and hopefully to get you on the right path going forward. You know, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. That's right. Okay, folks, catch me next week. As always, head over to Duke Loves Wrestling on Facebook, on Twitter. You can email me at Duke Loves Wrestling uh, at gmail.com, I should say. Um, send in your questions, your comments. Definitely give us a review. Five stars would be appreciated. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts slash iTunes or the iHeart Radio app or wherever you listen to the show. Now, keep those reviews coming in. They definitely mean something. They definitely matter. And uh, until next time, be kind to yourselves and be kind to others. Take it away, Tony Schiavone. This is Tony Schiavone, and we're definitely out of time on Duke Love Wrestling.